tax day has come and gone for many of you. Some may be filing extensions. And for those of you that are contractors, of which we're seeing many more, and for those of you that run your own businesses, oh boy, did you just feel the sharp pain of all your hard work being stripped away from you. You know why our system loves it when you get a job instead of working for yourself? When you get a job and you work, you certainly do see money taken away from your paycheck. You get it. You see the taxes withheld and you at first go, oh, it hurts. But for a lot of young people, it is a shock. Then they get used to it and they realize I don't actually make 20 bucks an hour. I make 12 because government Uncle Sam is going to come and take a big cut. Eventually, they get used to it and they look forward to tax day. You know why? Because the government gives you some of your money back. But for the people that run their own business, which is what most people should be doing, it's like getting a hand reaching into your chest and squeezing your heart as you're realizing the year ended. This is how much we had made. We're hoping we can use this for reinvesting or something. And then Uncle Sam comes and says, give me that. In this viral clip, this woman says she spent $20,000 today. Well, I got news for you, lady. You spent $20,000 on Ukraine. I hope you'd enjoy it. Now, this lady, I'm not saying is a supporter of the war in Ukraine. I'm saying this is where your tax money's going. Now, in reality, modern monetary policy has nothing to do with taking your tax money to pay for things. It's actually that they'll just print the money to pay for things and then tax you to pull money out of the money supply to deal with inflation. So they spent your money long before you gave it to them. Let me play this clip for you. You can hear what this lady has to say, and I think it's worth breaking down because she talks more. Uh, she talks about more than just taxes. She talks about the cost of goods. I just had $20,000 taken from my bank account. 14000 to the IRS, 6000 to the state of New York. And while I knew that this was coming, I just have a question. How are people supposed to survive in this economy? I've been running my business for eight years, and I've never had to pay this much in taxes. And granted, maybe we made a little bit more. I just feel like everything is just going to shit. I used to pay $400 to fill up my oil tank. It's now costing me $1,400 to fill up my oil tank. So I'll, I'll pause right there real quick for a lot of people that don't know. And I know most of you do, I do, but you know, let's, let's cut some slack to those who don't live in rural areas. Uh, for your heating, people have trucks come and they deliver oil that fill up a tank. She, she added a thousand dollars to her costs for heating her home. $400 a month for my electric bill, $5,600 a year for our car insurance, two cars, not fancy extravagant cars, not like $1 million coverages. We have comprehensive, we have collision, no accidents, no tickets. We've had this policy for over 20 years. The taxes on this house, $18,000 a year. Do I want to leave New York and Long Island? In a heartbeat, I would leave like that. Only reason that we are still here is because of family, because my entire family lives within a five mile radius of us. My kids are very close to their cousins. I'm close to my siblings, my parents, and that's really difficult for us to leave. How much longer can you actually stick it out? And I know a lot of people are going to watch this and be like, you have a beautiful house. You have nice cars. I'm not complaining. I am very thankful for everything that we have, but I am terrified from my children's future, and even from mine and my husband's future. As a small business owner, when can we retire? We don't get a pension. Our retirement is saving in our IRA or life insurance. Am I gonna be working until I'm 73 or 74 years old? My family is more important. I would rather struggle financially and be around family than be living, you know, with no money worries and being, you know, a thousand miles away from my family. If our taxes are $18,000 a year now, what are they going to be in five years? It's not like the county is going to come to us and be like, oh, for every year you're in the house, you're going to get a fucking discount. They just keep going up. I'm so thankful. We don't have credit card bills. Everything that we do, we do for our children. I'm working 70 hours a week. I should be able to be like, you know what? I want to go on a vacation for a week and a half. Last summer, we had one vacation booked, Ocean City, Maryland, and we ended up canceling it because I'm like, I can't see spending $3,000 to go to Maryland. Who fuck has money to even go on vacation? <laughs> Maryland. Who has money to even go on vacation? <clears throat> well, let's address some of these points. She doesn't want to leave her family. She works 70 hours a week. She is struggling as her costs keep going up. Right now, she feels comfortable, but she's shocked at how much is being ripped away. 
My friends, welcome to the negative pressure environment. When they went on TV and they said, there's too many people, climate change is a problem. Did you think they didn't mean it? It's funny because people can't see the long game. And so they don't really care. Not everybody. I don't know about this lady. She's a rural, per, you know, she's a rural uh, uh, mom. I'm assuming that she uh, probably votes more conservative or whatever, maybe moderate. But let me tell you, years ago, when they said that the ocean levels were going to rise and wipe everything out, they were telling you outright they will take from you. Your children will not know the luxuries you've had. But oh boy, I'm excited for this one. When she talks about property taxes. Ooh, this will be fun. Property taxes, you never truly own your house because you got to pay property taxes, rent to the government. And if at any point you don't, they come and take your house away. I love it because people in the U.S. like to rag on China. In China, you can't own land. You can buy a 99 year lease. You lease the land and have to pay for it. But it's yours for 99 years. Your kids can be handed the lease. But then once that lease expires, maybe you don't get to keep it. Well, it is worse than what we have here. You do get to own the land, sort of, but you got to pay Uncle Sam his cut. And if at any point you can't, they take it from you. So here's what happens. If you watch Yellowstone, you'll see a good example of what they do. <clears throat> so in Yellowstone, which uh, unfortunately I believe is canceled, you have this guy, the Yellowstone Ranch is this massive plot of land and everybody wants his land. He's had it for seven generations or whatever. It's massive land. Well, the government comes and says, you got to pay your property taxes. And this is a massive plot of land. And that property tax is quite a bit. Here's what you can do. Sell a piece of the land to pay for the property taxes. And that's what happens. See, this is how the game is played. You can take a look at large plots of land in rural areas. And you'll notice like housing divisions. So what is fairly common is that 200 years ago, some guy goes and he's like, I stake this here claim in this 25 acres where I will have a farm and take care of my family. A few generations later, property taxes start coming in. The counties are forming. All that stuff happens. And they say, you got to pay property tax on the value of the property. And they say, well, OK, well, we'll take a cut of what we make and we'll sell it and pay the property taxes. Nowadays, you'll notice that there's subdivisions. The plot of land that was 25 acres is now 20 acres with five small houses along the side of it. Why? Because every year when the government comes and says, you got to pay property taxes, your land isn't making money. It's just land you have that, you know, you might grow food on. But how do you make enough money to pay the government what they want off the value of the land perceived by the market, which has nothing to do with what you can produce on the land? So they divide off an acre and they sell it to a developer for a couple hundred K. The developer builds a house and sells it. And then they take that couple hundred K and they give it to the government. And then every year or so, they're chopping off chunks of the land to try and pay for the land. And as it gets smaller, the property taxes go down, but the value goes up, so it stabilizes. Eventually, you lose all of your land. Eventually, your kids inherit it and say, there's no point in having this land. Why even bother? And then it's gone. Now I'll tell you what's going to happen and why I find this uh, just so fascinating. Property value, I believe, will either uh, skyrocket to the point of being impossible to own, or collapse entirely. Don't know for sure. I remember looking at buildings in Ukraine when I was covering uh, stories in Kiev. And I was wondering what the cost of a condo in Ukraine was. I was like, it's got to be super cheap in Kiev, right? These people, their average income is like 400 bucks a month. And if they're paying 100 bucks a month in rent, it's got to be like, what, 50K to own a condo or something? Nope. 300K, 400K, a million. What? No Ukrainian citizen could own that. And they didn't. I asked my friends, how is this possible? I mean, who, who could afford to buy these properties? Why the, the oligarchs? They own it all. Yep. A small handful of ultra wealthy elites. They buy up all the property. The property is poorly maintained. And the people who live there pay what very little they can pay. And the oligarchs don't let anybody else buy it. Nobody wants to sell it. So where are we going? Well, for a while, I was saying, I think what will happen is once the boomers die, because all generations die, I'm not trying to be disrespectful, and uh, Gen Xers and millennials start inheriting these properties. What's going to happen is there's going to be a millennial who inherits a house, and it's happening now. 
They're going to inherit a $300,000 house in a suburban or rural area. And they're going to say, look, I don't live in Indiana. Okay. I live in California. I don't want to deal with this house. Can you guys just sell it? Okay. We'll get a, we'll get a real estate broker. We'll put it on the market. Nobody buys it. Why? Millennials don't have money. Millennials ain't got no money, so they ain't buying it. So then they come back and they say, we, we can't sell it at this price. And the, and the millennial just says, I don't care. Like I inherited this house. Okay. Just how much can I get for it? And they're like, well, we can drop the price by 10K, 20K, 30K, 40K, 50K. Housing prices start dropping off because millennials can't afford to buy expensive houses. And they say, just sell it for what I can get. You got a cash offer. It's 200, a hundred less than it's worth. Well, I don't care. Just give me the money and they'll take it. Now, I, I thought that may happen and that would lead to a massive collapse of property values because there's not going to be any demand. But then I realized something else with BlackRock and these other companies. Mm, no, not so much. What may happen, and it could, it could go one, one, uh, one way or the other. What may end up happening is that when the properties are inherited by young people, they say, put it on the market for 300. A rich guy who owns 50 properties and can afford it says, yeah, sure, I'll take it. The millennial family, the young guy and girl who want to get a new house for their kids can't afford it. So they don't buy it. The property value stays the same. The millennial who inherits it says, woohoo, 300 grand. What should I go do with all my money that I inherited? And they'll spend it on things. They'll pay rent, but they probably won't own much. They won't be able to buy anything with that money because that's a rural suburban property and they want to live in a city. The price may actually go up even when they get it because these big companies are willing to pay a premium. The possibility is, you know, it was, it was uh, I think it was Tristan Tate, it might have been Andrew Tate, eh, the Tate Brothers, said the portal is closing. Get rich now before it's too late. And they're right. I completely agree with them. I call it uh, breaking the barrier. It's because it's not about wealth. It's about finding your groove where you're generating enough revenue to uh, exceed the standard of living, right? There's beneath the threshold where you struggle every day. And I've been there where it's like you're, you're playing whack-a-mole with your bills. And then there's the point where you're covering all your bills and you're making slightly more. I don't, I don't think it's necessarily about getting rich. I call it breaking the barrier. And that means like, I don't know, 80 to 100K. It's like you finally have a little extra disposable income. You can start saving and putting places. That's the barrier for a lot of people. You're struggling because you're like, man, I got to skip this. We're not going to eat as much tonight. You know, oh, rent is due. And, and you're, you're, you're bouncing your bills around trying to, to stay afloat. When the Tate brothers were saying, it's getting harder and harder to make money and get rich. It is, it, it, it's getting harder and harder and the wealthier are getting wealthier and the poorer are getting poorer. Big corporations are buying up properties. Wealthy individuals are buying up properties. Young people are just renting and costs are going up. The higher costs go, like with what this lady is saying about her filling up her oil and all that, what that means is, and what she's complaining about is she is sinking. She's close to the surface right now. And she's like, look, I'm not complaining. Like, I'm right here. There are people beneath me. The challenge, however, is that eventually she will sink to the bottom. The water level is going up and you have to keep swimming as fast as you can to get to the top. For those that have broken the barrier, you are treading water at the surface. And it's a bit easier, but the water is rising. It's getting harder and harder to stay afloat. Some people have gone beyond and they've jumped into a boat and now they're just floating straight upward. And I think that's what the Tates are talking about. Getting rich to the point where you'll never be poor again. The, Andrew Tate tweeted something about spending 10 million on Bitcoin and then making a million dollars in a day, not even thinking about it. He's like, man, that's crazy. I just made a million bucks in one day because I bought Bitcoin and sold. And I don't know if he sold, but he's like, I bought Bitcoin. And a lot of people will never make that in, you know, 10, 20, 30 years. Yeah, he was like, get rich now because the wealthy are trying to shut it all down. Which brings me to the end of this video. What this lady is basically saying and showing us, it's the negative pressure environment. They want to make it too difficult to live. They want you to curtail expectations. They want you to live in a van. Why do you think van life videos got pumped up in the algorithm? Don't buy a house, buy a van and go live by the water. It's so great. You'll enjoy it. You can't have kids. I mean, some people probably do if you get a bus or something. 
But uh, your costs will be so much lower just living in your van down by the river. Me, I'm fairly minimalist. I would rather do that than sell my principles. But it's kind of wild to think about. A couple hundred years ago, you just build a house somewhere and you start getting food for your family. You go hunt, you forage, you do work. It was manageable. It made a lot less. Now, you need so much more to maintain yourself in this system. A cell phone and a car, they're a must-have. You can't, you can't function in this economy without a vehicle. Why? Because the competition. It used to be that you get a little buggy and you could wheel the, your, 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 you know, your cart or get a horse to pull it. Now, if you do that, well, someone else has got a car and they can pull their food to town before you can sell yours. So it's competition. Technology makes us all compete with each other at higher and higher levels. It is getting harder to stay afloat. Eventually, I think what happens is there'll be a cultural break and people will just say, I don't care anymore. I'm tired of working so hard. I just want to relax with my family. And so what do they do? They'll eat the bugs and they'll live in the pod and they'll say it's not so bad. And then eventually they'll normalize and get used to it and say, you know, my dad lived in the pod and ate the bugs and he was proud to have arrested Donald Trump. Ah, you see, I went there, right? One day, a generation or two from now, young people are going to say, what's the big deal? My dad, you know, had a house, but he said we should live in the pot and eat the bugs. He gladly served his oppressors because he knew that one day I'd be happy living in the pot and eating the bugs. What a sad reality. That's where we're going. Tax day, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you enjoyed it. I'll leave it there. Next segment's coming up at 8 p.m. over at youtube.com slash timcastirl. Thanks for hanging out. And I'll see you all then.